That's a clown question, bro. So I'm gonna kick some dirt. He gets on base. Just a bit outside. I'm not the type of player that's gonna be Johnny Hustle. If you don't want me to watch the ball, you can go get it out of the ocean. And welcome to the show to be named later, where we're talking baseball kind of whenever. Over there on the other side of the screen is Daniel Curran. How you doing, Daniel? I'm doing good, Chris. It's been, once again, another fun week of research. Today we got Shoeless Joe Jackson. We got the 2013 Pittsburgh Pirates uh, team, once again, like our last team, brought a winning culture into their city. And we also might have baseball this year, maybe? Yeah, it's a possibility. Uh, you know, as of last week, uh, negotiations weren't looking great. I mean, there was a lot of criticism uh, on the owners, especially from the players. I remember there was a quote like, quote, like, players are livid. So, you know, yeah. that was a bad sign. Max Serger, of all people, was lashing out on Twitter. Yeah, a lot of, uh, you know, countless guys. There was Max Scherzer, you know, mm -hmm. Trevor Bauer, of course, on the front lines. You're always going to hear him. Uh, nothing wrong with that. Like, we, we, are a, we are a Trevor Bauer-friendly program here at the show to be named later. Yeah. And I, we're all for – what he's been doing to advocate against the Astros for the players, for major league baseball, for the fans. Like he's been a really good advocate for the game and we are big Trevor Bauer fans over here. Oh yeah. He's, he's doing a lot, doing a lot for the game of baseball, doing a lot for, uh, for pitching as well. You know, in that information factory at, at driveline baseball, but then, you know, also uh, I remember Sean Doolittle, I think had, had some words about, negotiations but I think more recent more recently actually good on Sean Doolittle and the Nationals they're yeah they're paying the the minor league players salaries David is, Price too I mean it's it's sad that they have to go there like I like I appreciate their efforts but they shouldn't have to put in this effort and like yeah, David Price a, as well paying a thousand dollars for every Do uh, Dodgers minor leaguer like that's uh, for the next month you know, it's really encouraging to see in a tough time where, you know, we, we've talked many times, Chris, about how minor leaguers aren't treated fairly and how they don't get paid enough and they're barely able to, like, even live off the salaries they make in the minors. Some of them have to have second jobs. And they're finally getting a bit of a pay raise where it's, I think, 400 a week instead of 250 a week. And now, obviously, COVID breaks out. And obviously, you couldn't have predicted this. Like, it's not necessarily their fault, but it's come to this where – over a thousand players got released in the minors this week, I believe. Yeah, yeah, that was that was some rough news, but you know, of course, it it would happen. It it happens with the circumstances, but the the big news from baseball, yes. big news from baseball, is uh, there's bet, better news coming from the players' side. Uh, there was a proposal by Major League Baseball. It was made, or I think Major League Baseball and the players kind of are hung up on a like 50 to 60 game schedule and fully prorated salaries. So what what do we what are what exactly are we thinking about this? Well, I mean the the players union initially put out a 114 game um, schedule, fully prorated salaries, obviously. And I don't think they put that out with the intentions of having a 114 game season. I think they did that. So the, so the owners would uh, counter that with like 70 to 80 games around meeting in the middle uh, or at least half a season. And I think that was the goal that they were hoping to get out of that. And the union, or I'm sorry, the owners responded by uh, proposing a 50 game season, once again, full prorated salaries. Uh, I believe the regular season ending on October 31st. Yeah. Um, and then the playoffs going into November, maybe even December, but I think it's, I mean, it's definitely, nothing is guaranteed at this point. I don't know if the players are going to like the 50 game season idea. Uh, I think, yeah, I think they were hoping more towards like between maybe 70 and 80 games. Um, yeah. But we'll have to see, I guess. Yep. Yeah. It's, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of inside, uh, literally inside baseball stuff yeah. going on with, the uh, with with the players' association and the owners um, seems things seem to be looking better. I wasn't really personally. I wasn't really pushing the panic button last week. I, I I've always thought there was going to be a season this year. What 
what what do you what did you what were you thinking like the past week um i mean it really the cba has been a little flawed for a while like i remember when in the bryce harper manny machado offseason where they both went until february like there were a lot of complaints about it then and obviously you have this sort of situation where you know it's it wasn't planned out you know no, no one knew, nobody knew that this was going to be happening six months ago but you have this scenario now where you're trying to figure out, you know, if you can have a season at all, like realistically, like money aside, like if it's safe enough to have a season, then if so, what precautions you're going to take. And the big issue has been how you're going to pay your players. You know, it was reported back in March, uh, Trevor Bauer even said it on Twitter that the players agreed to a fully prorated salary, meaning that they will take pay cuts in accordance to the games that they're missing. So say if there's an, if there's an 81 game season, that of course is half of 162 the players would take a 50% pay cut from what they were initially supposed to make. So, you know, Mike Trout is making $34 million uh, or whatever it is. He'll make half that in 2020, given that he's only playing 81 games. And the league kept pushing for more pay cuts. And obviously the players weren't taken kindly to that. And rightfully so, like, you, you should get, be able to get your money. Like, these owners have all of it, even if they are going to lose for one season. Uh, I think you should fairly try to represent yourself uh, in a way that you feel is possible. And, you know, Scott Boris has been on that same side trying to push all his players. Uh, so it's, it's been a lot of a, it's been very complicated for the owners and the players to find some sort of middle ground here. Yeah. I think there's, there's definitely a, some teetering going on the, the players in any league players associations and their league, they usually kind of go through, a little back and forth, maybe every like 25, 30 years. So mm-hmm. the last strike, last time it got bad was 94. The NFL had a lockout in 2011. And I think the, the strike before that was in like 1982 or something like that. The, the NBA and NHL had ones like around the same time, I believe, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah, so Major League Baseball is to this point, this could change at some point. Uh, is the only league that didn't have a strike uh, in the 21st century so yeah. far. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. And... The CBA is up after 2021. So, like, that could change after after 2021, but we'll worry about that then. Yeah, that that definitely could change. And, you know, luckily for us, the fans, there was a pretty good off offseason uh, this past yeah. off season because the previous two were were pretty bad. Was... They were pretty bad, but – this past off season, you know, guys were getting paid and they were getting paid quick. So maybe that changes things. Well, but, we also, we also had uh, baseball in the news a lot with, you know, the biggest scandals since one of the ones that we're going to be talking about today. Yeah. Yeah. One of the, one of the biggest scandals, it was the biggest scandal in baseball in about a hundred years. And someone said, really, yeah, the only thing you could argue is the steroid era, like especially all the A-Rod stuff. Yeah, that's but yeah, that then, more... I, I would listen to the argument that the Astros thing is even even worse than the A Rod because like steroids were a thing well before A Rod, but you know what the Astros were doing is is a first time that we know of at least. And you know, it's, to the extent that they were doing it, like obviously stealing signs has been in the game forever, but you know, stealing signs with technology that's been do that's I'm sure that's been done a lot more than people realize, but not as egregiously as the Astros were doing it with the trash cans and the cameras in center field and possibly the buzzers and the band-aids and stuff like that. Yeah, that the Astros literally, like, they broke the game. They didn't, yeah. like, they they kind of, uh, it's like if, if they were playing a video game, they just kind of, like, found, you know, literally a cheat code. Mm-hmm. Like, steroids, you kind of, like, turn the sliders down a little bit. But the yeah, Astros it's like you put didn't. the game on easy mode almost. Yeah. The, you just like you, you, you take your creative player and just like tick up his power a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And you know that what the Astros did was was absurd. And yeah, yeah. I would put like steroids, especially like pre two thousand five, it was al- almost like pretty much fair game. The A Rod thing was weird because that was kind of a, a legal thing that kind of took itself out of baseball a little bit because a-rod took it off the field like if so if, if you have a netflix account look up screwball it's an it's a documentary uh with tony bosch a-rod's dealer 
that where Tony just talks about the whole thing and what happens. And A-Rod, like, first of all, he lied about it on national television. You can go to YouTube and look at that E60 interview. But also, like, when MLB was investigating, A-Rod literally hired people to mess around with MLB's investigation and, and sort of sabotage it. So he went to great lengths uh, to make sure that he wasn't found guilty, and he eventually was anyway. So, Yeah, yeah, that was that was a, a fun, fun story. Of course, happened out of Florida, where all the weird stories happen. Miami. Miami. And, uh, yeah, it, speaking of scandals, our player for today's episode was involved in a huge scandal. Possibly, you know, you could argue differently, possibly the biggest scandal in Major League Baseball history. Maybe even sports history. Uh, yeah, I mean like – yeah. What else are we thinking from the other professional sports? Like Lance I mean, Armstrong, maybe? You know, I, I know uh, in the NBA, a referee had some money. Yep, that's a good one. That That's a pretty good one. But, like, very similar scenarios. And this uh, it, Shoeless Joe Jackson was one of eight men banned from baseball because of this giant scandal. Yep. But first, we will start off with his origins because, you know, what some people forget is Shoeless Joe Jackson was a spectacular baseball player. And by the way, if you don't know, if you don't know what we're doing, uh, we're you know we've we started our uh, our baseball show started on radio in Springfield. Um, mm-hmm. That was in, in October. Pretty much talking MLB news and you know playoffs, playoff stuff then eventually off-season stuff because, you know, every week something usually happens in the off-season, especially this off-season. There was a lot of stuff for us to, to break down. And, you know, COVID, COVID comes out. Uh, COVID just kills all sports, all sports talk. So we decide we are going to do – we are going to go history-based. Uh, I have picked 30 players, assigned them a number randomly. Uh, Daniel has picked 30 teams and assigned a team randomly. And uh, every week we pick a number that the number that uh, is assigned to that player. That's the player we're going to be talking about. And this week it landed on Shoeless Joe Jackson and the 2013 Pirates. The 2013 Pirates will be released as part two of episode 39. It will be Mm -hmm. released on Friday. It will be the next episode here on whatever platform you're listening to as of the recording date, we're on Spotify and YouTube and uh, we're hoping we can get into Apple podcasts soon. We're trying. Trying. Sent the email, got the RSS feed. I I figured that whole ordeal out. Maybe, maybe it'll work. But anyway, shoeless Joe Jackson. He, one of the most, one of the more mysterious cases um, in baseball history. He grew up, in Pickens County, South Carolina. And his father, uh, his father found work at a mill near Greenville, South Carolina. And uh, Joe was actually the oldest of eight children. And he started working at that mill around the age of six or seven. So this, this was definitely a guy who, you know, pure that that's 1800s lifestyle right there. 1800s lifestyle. Like, Thankfully, post Civil War, post slavery. Yeah, but. right out of the right out of the uh, womb and and into into labor yeah. as a six or seven year old. And uh, as he was working, he actually never attended school, which explains his famous illiteracy. And uh, you know, he didn't learn much in a classroom setting, but he did learn how to play baseball. And uh, mm-hmm. the mill sponsored a baseball team the mill that he was working at sponsored baseball team and that team played against other teams from other mills and uh joe played for his mill his mill was called brandon mill and he got a spot in the starting lineup at the age of 13 years old and because of his unusually large wingspan uh he was actually very good at throwing and hitting particularly and uh you know, this is a lot of stuff that I've, you know, I learned from uh, his Society of American Baseball Research page. And uh, a quote from there said, 
He soon became renowned throughout, Car throughout the Carolinas as an outfielder, pitcher, and home run hitter, which were known throughout the Mill League as Saturday Specials. I love it, that. This is like, when I considered like dead ball era guys, you know, for, um, you know, for the, for the show, because I know there's not a lot of footage of them and I know information might be limited. This is the type of stuff that I was looking for when I, when I, can we, can we uh, don this nickname to Michael Lorenzen because he has done all three of those things. Yes. Michael Lorenzen, the Saturday special. Yeah. He's played Remember? outfield occasionally. Of course he hits home runs and he's literally a pitcher. Yeah. Yeah. A Saturday special. And another cool uh, story that I found from Society of American Baseball Research. Uh, quote, a local fan named Char Charlie Ferguson made bats in his spare time, and he chose a four by four beam from the north side of a particularly strong hickory tree to make one for young Joe Jackson. It measured 36 inches long and weighed about 48 ounces. That's a plus 12 bat. That's a huge bat. Ferguson darkened the bat with tobacco juice. Joe called it Black Betsy and eventually took it to the major leagues. So that's his famous Black Betsy. And, you know, how else, how else do you get a bat in, uh, in the 1800s slash early 1900s? That's how you do it. That's how Shoeless Joe Jackson got his famous bat, Black Betsy. There's actually, I, in, in the research that I found, there's actually a website called blackbetsy.com and it's a Shoeless Joe Jackson virtual hall of fame. So for oh, those no way. Home, feel free to check that out. Nice. There's, actually, there's actually stats from his outlaw leagues from after he got banned by major league baseball. There's no like on base percentage or anything like that, but the, it has like his average, his number of hits, number of runs, a lot of cool stuff on there. Thankfully, thankful for that. So Back to the legendary story of Shoeless Joe Jackson. So he signed with a Class D team in the Carolina Association called the Greenville Spinners for $75 a month. So that was his first professional experience. He's with the Greenville Spinners, a Class D league. It was a new team uh, in the Carolina Association and right around when Shoeless Joe Jackson would be playing for such a team. And he signed his first professional contract by marking an X uh, because he was illiterate. He didn't have any sense of how to write. And in this league, he hit a league leading 346 uh, to go along with sp spectacular center field defense, pretty much a, a five tool player in the Carolina Association. And during one of these games in 1908, uh, he decided to play with just stockings on his feet because uh, his shoes, his baseball shoes, new baseball shoes were not worn in yet. So he just played with, you know, regular socks and just uh, was going out playing a baseball game. And that garnered the nickname Shoeless Joe Jackson. And, I love uh, how that stuck so well. Like you play one game without shoes, a hundred years later, people know you as Shoeless Joe Jackson. It's like crazy. one, like just one random day. Oops, I forgot my shoes. Okay, I guess people are going to call me Shoeless Joe Jackson for the next 100 years. Yeah, it's literally like a middle school nickname, and it just yeah. stuck with him <laughs> for the rest of his life. Yeah. So. Someone, someone must have been really petty that day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> someone wanted to, someone was a little jealous of Joe, and he's like, look at this guy, Shoeless look Joe Jackson. Dude. Look at this guy. Who does he think he is? But another good thing that happened in 1908 for Mr. Shoeless Joe Jackson married his wife, Katie. And Kate, you know, I usually don't mention like uh, marital relationships when I'm doing research, even though it's available. But Katie was very important in Joe's life, Shoeless Joe's life, because he stuck with him for the rest of his life till he died. And she wrote his letters, he managed his money, and he read. Uh, Shoeless Joe's contracts for him, so she was a she was extremely important to uh, Shoeless Joe's Shoeless Joe Jackson's life, and um, kind of how he went about his professional life. And in August of 1908, to cap off this great year for Shoeless Joe, Philadelphia Atlantic 
Philadelphia Athletics manager Connie Mack uh, bought Shoeless Joe Jackson's contract for $900, making Shoeless Joe Jackson a member of Major League Baseball. So, of course, he's going up to Philadelphia now, and Shoeless Joe had, was very reluctant, reluctant uh, to go north. You know, he spent his whole life in the Carolinas. He was well-known down there. You know, he was entering uncharted territory, which, you know, you got to keep in mind, in 1908, there's not a whole lot of knowledge about the whole world, you know, outside of where you live, especially if you're illiterate, you didn't go to school like Shoeless Joe. So rightfully so for him to be, you know, a little reluctant about uh, heading from, you know, from the Carolinas to Philadelphia. And his manager from Greenville accompanied him on his train ride to Philadelphia. Uh, so, you know, he wouldn't have to feel alone and he could feel like he can, he can go to someone. And he hit a single in his first at bat on the athletics. And three days later, uh, he got a train back to Greenville because he was homesick. He lasted about three days. And then he played four games about two weeks later and went a grand total of two for 19 and went back to Greenville. So that is his 1908. In 1909, he mostly played in the minors, but he hit 358 on a Class C team in Savannah, Georgia. And he played a whole five games in the majors that year. And in 1910, he played most in the minors again, but he hit 354 on a Class A team in New Orleans. And manager Connie Mack determined Jackson couldn't succeed in Philadelphia, and he was later traded to Cleveland in exchange for outfielder Briss Lord, great name, for $6,000. So then in Cleveland, he's there from 1910 to 1914. And after the minor league season was over, he was called up to Cleveland because he was more comfortable with his teammates there. And most of them were with him in the South. And in the remaining 20 games that he played in the majors, he hit 387 with a 1032 OPS. So that leads Shoeless Joe Jackson into his first full year of major league action. Uh, they, you know, Cleveland saw how good he was um, in the majors of the year prior, and it, they decided to make him a full-time starter. And it's unfortunate that actually in the, during the 1910 season, he exceeded his rookie limits because this would have been maybe the greatest rookie season of all time. Yeah. Shoeless Joe Jackson in 1911 in his rookie season, he hit 408. That's correct. 408 hit, had 200, 33 hits. Wow. A 1058 OPS, a 193 OPS plus, a 184 weighted runs created plus, and 41 stolen bases. I'm going to, I usually don't mention, you know, at least for single seasons, I don't really usually mention like OPS plus and weighted runs created plus, but it's important for a, a dead ball era guy because, you know, offense was not, um, offense was not huge you know it's called the dead ball era for a reason so like mm -hmm. 193 ops plus that would have been first this year and like the example I, i'll use so i looked yesterday so uh shoeless joe or yeah so nelson cruz last year he had a 1031 ops and a 166 ops plus shoeless joe he had a 1058 OPS, which would be less than Cruz, but he had a 193 OPS plus, which is 27 points higher than uh, Cruz's was last year. So, like, it was a lot harder to um, have that's a hard higher have. OPS last year. So that's why I'm I'm using the OPS plus and the weighted runs created plus. Also, I'm going to make another example here. The 233 hits, uh, just for reference, Ichiro only did that three times in a single season. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he and he was widely regarded as one of the best pure hitters of all time. Correct, and correct. In, basically, this is in his first full season, and Ishiro did it in his first full season too, but he also, it wasn't his first professional season. Correct, correct. He had about seven years in Japan. Mm -hmm. And Jackson, Jackson's 408 average is an all-time record for someone in their first four seasons, and it's, you know, up there overall as well. And also to go with all those statistics, he led the league with a 468 on base percentage. Also, he finished second in average hits, OPS, OPS plus, weighted runs created plus, and wins above replacement. And you're thinking, how could he possibly, how could he possibly 
ranks second in any of these categories, especially average. He hit 408. Ty Cobb beat him out in all those previous statistics mentioned. Uh, Ty Cobb hit 420 that year in 1911. But Ty Cobb, Ty Cobb actually gave him props at the end of the season, and he said, quote, Joe is a grand ball player and one who will get better and better. There is no de- denying that he is a better ball player his first year in the big league than I ever was. So Ty Cobb is basically saying, like, he's a, probably on a better tra- trajectory than I am. So then in 1912, uh, Jackson continues his dominance. He leads the league in hits with 226, and he sets the American League record for triples with 26. And it's been tied since. That happened in 1914. But it has never been surpassed uh, since he set that record. And also that year, he finished second in average with a 395 average. He finished second in on-base percentage with a 458 on-base percentage. Also slugging percentage with a 579. uh, OPS with a 1036. OPS plus with a 191. And he was also third in weighted runs created plus uh, with 186. He also stole 35 bases to go with that. And he was fourth among position players in baseball reference war and tied for second in fan graphs war. And in fact, everyone ahead of Shoeless Joe Jackson that year in 1912 was a Hall of Famer. Uh, Ty Cobb, Tris Speaker, and Home Run Baker, those were the guys that were ahead of him in baseball reference war. All of them are Hall of Famers. So it's not like he was uh, was very far off there. Then in 1913, he finishes second in average with a 373, a career low, 373. on base percentage with 460 and OPS plus uh, with 192. Finished second in all of those categories. And he led the league in hits with 197, doubles with 39, slugging percentage with 551, OPS with uh, 1011, and he was tied for first in weighted runs created plus. And he finished fourth in both baseball reference war and fan graphs war. And this time also, he was behind. All Hall of Famers, Eddie Collins, Tris Speaker, and Home Run Baker, all Hall of Famers were ahead of him in the nineteen. Legendary Home Run Baker, who hit 96 career home runs. Yeah, that's dead ball era for you. That's me, dead ball era. Say, I'm pretty and sure that, that's true. It's, I know it was like less than 100, but very close to it. Yeah, and, you know, no shame on him. He was still leading the league. Yep, exactly 96. I was right. That's correct. And he that's led correct. the league. In, in 1914, the exact year you were just talking about, home run Baker led the league with nine home runs. Yep, Cody what, a, what a time in baseball. And I bet like four of, them, I bet four of them were inside the park. <laughs> they were in like polo grounds. You hit the dead center. Yep, yep. If that even existed at that point. Yeah, dead ball, dead ball era baseball for you. Gotta love it. Gotta love it. So, Shoeless Joe Jackson, a tremendous, a tremendous three-year run from 1911 to 1913. In those seasons, he averaged a 393 average, 462 on-base percentage, 574 slugging percentage, 1036 OPS, 192 OPS plus, 185 weighted runs created plus, 219 hits, 119 runs scored, 43 doubles, 21 triples, and 34 stolen bases per year in that 1911 to 1913 stretch. Also from 1911 to 1913, he led the league in hits, runs scored, doubles. He also ranked second in triples, the whole quadruple slash line, which is average on base percentage, slugging percentage. And therefore OPS. And and OPS. And he also was second in wins above replacement. Uh, All those categories where he ranked second, that was behind Ty Cobb, who was probably the great, yeah, the greatest dead ball era player of all time. And, you know, I think he's fourth all time in position player war um, on baseball reference. So, I was going to say Walter Johnson would like a word. Yeah, an all an all time, all time great for sure. And then in 1914, uh, Shoeless Joe kind of takes a step back, but he's still spectacular. He hits 338 with an 862 OPS has a 156 OPS plus, 153 weighted runs created plus, 
and you know possibly why he took a step back is because he was injured in an automobile accident actually broke his leg and he uh, missed 31 games for the naps and for the cleveland naps how how and, fast did automobiles go back then um <laughs> uh, yeah it was a it was a crazy 23 how does that happen collision yeah i don't know i don't know he, he didn't get out of the way in time well, I, I bet the cars weighed, like, something crazy. Oh, they definitely, like, were heavier, probably. So maybe so maybe the total force just, just got him. It was like having, like, a leg under a car just snaps. I don't know. <laughs> but Shoeless Joe, he did miss 31 games for the Cleveland Naps. The Cleveland Naps, they went 51-102 and 102 that year. So it was a rough year for, for everyone on that team. Literally, the and, losses uh, were double the wins. Exactly. Yeah, it was it was bad, pretty bad. Equivalent to going fifty four and one hundred eight today, mm-hmm. and his uh, eight sixty two OPS ranked fifth in the American League. And then it then you know this is where things get interesting off the field for Shoeless Joe Jackson. That a, a wild wild story. That I don't know what happened today. You're gonna want to have to 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 listen in for this one. So in the winter leading up to the 1915 season, he developed stardom as a vaudeville star in the South. Vaudeville is like a, basically a variety show. It could be, it could be anything. It, it could be like some type of comedy, some type of sketch stuff. Um, apparently it was a story where it was like his, his story at, you know, being a star in baseball, like going, growing up from a cotton mill to being like a major league star or whatever. So he would sell out venues in the South doing this act. And, uh, he had, he had a group of, uh, girls that would follow him around, maybe sell some tickets and they were called Joe Jackson's baseball girls and rumors swirled that he was spending a lot of time with one of those uh, Joe Jackson's baseball girls, one of them in particular, and his wife actually heard these rumors, and he and she hired an attorney and filed for divorce. And then when a sheriff served Joe the papers, they got in a physical altercation, and according to one reporter, that left the sheriff badly battered. So I guess Joe just like heard about the divorce and just decided to beat up the sheriff. I mean, I guess he had to take the anger out on someone, but I guess he kind of end up, ended up looking like a hero in the situation. And then he returned to his wife the following morning after the altercation, and uh, his wife removed the request to divorce him. Happy ending in the marriage. Maybe not for the sheriff, but in the marriage. Marriage works out, and Joe Jackson actually abandons that tour uh, and anything that he could have made off of that. And uh, that's, that's his Vaudeville stor- stardom start to end. Mm-hmm. Interesting story uh, heading into the 1915 season. I mean, it's a good thing media didn't exist back then because that would have been a huge off the field problem that could have translated on the field. But it yes. did. Uh, he went off to Chicago in 2015 to play for the White Sox. 1915. I'm sorry, what did I say? You said 2015. <laughs> That was close enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he, he played for, he played with Jose Abreu. I yeah. don't know if he was over there, yeah. Yeah. Um, he hit, in 1915, he hit 327 with an 858 OPS and a 155. An 858 OPS with 155 weight OPS plus is hilarious. Yeah. That's, That's all in, era. in modern times, it's like a 103. Yeah, yeah. Especially juice ball era. Exactly. Uh, in what, so that was, uh, that was 1915. And Cleveland's owner uh, was actually on the brink of bankruptcy, so he signed Jackson uh, to a three-year deal so he could trade him to the White Sox in exchange for $31,500 and three players. Uh, so he hits 272 with a 378 OBP and a 777 OPS for the remainder of the, of the season with Chicago. And so he got traded midseason, essentially. And he had an 830 overall OPS, which ranked fourth in the AL. That's like 100th today. Yeah, yeah. In 1916, uh, we're, we're getting so close to the live ball era here. Um, he hits three, 
41 with an 888 OPS and a 166 OPS plus. He had a league leading 21 triples. He ranked third in average, second in hits, second in slugging, third in OPS, fourth in BWAR, and third in FWAR. Uh, he was only behind Hall of Famers Ty Cobb, Tris Speaker, and Eddie Collins in baseball reference war that season. Yeah, so I, I mentioned that uh, 166 OPS plus. The 166 OPS plus, uh, that goes with an 888 OPS in 1916. In 2019, Nelson Cruz had a 166 OPS plus, uh, and he had a 1031 OPS. So yeah. that Down shows you the difference in today's day and the guy we're talking about uh, today. So – in 1917, that's when things heat up for the Chicago White Sox. He, him personally, Joe Jackson, not the most spectacular year, you know, very good, but not the most spectacular year for Shoeless Joe. In 1917, he hits 301 with an 805 OPS and a 143 OPS plus. And the White Sox, I mentioned they heat up. They go 154 uh, and make the World Series. And Joe Jackson, he had a he had an oddly spotty World Series, had a positive win probability added, but he had uh, two three hit games. Uh, those those games were Game Two and Game Five, but in the other games, in the other four games, he went one for fourteen. Uh, and overall in the series, he finished with a three hundred four average and a six thirty eight OPS. So he was contributing not at the highest level but he was contributing and then in 1918 uh, there was some controversy I guess off the field again and uh, with World War One heating up some men were were uh, getting drafted and going off to fight uh, the war in World War One but Joe Jackson opted to do work to help with the war rather than going to combat so he helped at a shipyard in Delaware that uh, built battleships and you know this angered a lot of people it kind of built some distrust with him and the media because the media kind of went after him as well and after two of his teammates lefty williams you'll hear lefty williams's name again uh, lefty williams and bird lynn uh, they joined him at the shipyard to work there at delaware uh, owner charles comiskey initially did not want any of them back on the team he said quote there is no room on my club for players who wish to evade the army draft by entering the employ of ship concerns. So Charles Comiskey was enraged with, with this idea, but he kind of pulled back on the comment um, heading into 1919. But Shoeless Joe Jackson in 1918 only played 17 games that year, kind of a lost year um, for you know, probably a, a lot of Major League Baseball. Uh, Red Sox won the World Series that year, though, so that was cool. <laughs> and now we move into 1919. Uh, he ranks fourth in the AL. I'm sorry, fourth in the league in average with a 351, third in OPS with a 928, and an OPS plus actually lower than you may think, 159, still really good. Uh, but compared to a 928 OPS, it's actually smaller than what it was with an 888. And an 858 mm -hmm. as well. Correct. Uh, so people figured out how to hit a little better in 1919, but that's okay because Shoeless Joe was still doing his thing. The team went 88 and 52 and made it to the World Series once again. And Shoeless Joe hit 375 with a 956 OPS, much better performance this time in the World Series, one home run and six RBI. However, the White Sox actually lost to the, to the Reds that year in the World Series. The Reds won the 1919 World Series. And uh, we'll hear plenty more about that coming on up. But in 1920, he ranked third in the AL in average with a 382, uh, fourth in OPS with a 1033, and third in OPS plus with a 172. He led the league in triples with 20. And entering the final week of the season, allegations came out that Jackson and seven other men took money from gamblers to throw the 1919 World Series. He was suspended immediately by Charles Comiskey. So that leads into the scandal. The scandal. The, the uh, famous 1919 Black Sox scandal. Uh, you know, I watched Eight Men Out, and then I realized, you know, looking more into it, the, 
the um that was a hand fart if if you heard that i put i put my hands together made yep. a little made a little fart noise so don't think i i totally just disrespected everybody there but anyway anyway leads to the scandal and you know eight men out actually kind of paints the pop the players in a more positive light and you know they made it seem like they were getting you know quote unquote poverty wages or whatever so and you know the white Sox actually had the third highest payroll in the american league so it was an interesting way to to look at things but the mastermind of the whole scandal was chick gandal first baseman for the white Sox, and he recruited jackson uh in the throwing of this 1919 world series and jackson actually denied a ten thousand dollar offer but when the offer was up double to twenty thousand dollars he accepted it and jackson like many of the uh, players received only five thousand dollars so joe like most of the like most of the fixers you know chick gandal being an evil genius uh you know joe jackson only gets five thousand dollars chick gandal he gets uh he pocketed about thirty five thousand dollars because like the quote from eight men out was like what are you gonna do call the cops call the cops after you don't get enough money from the world series you threw and he highballed charles comiskey for a money he knew he wasn't gonna get and he just decided to retire uh after that with the thirty five thousand dollars he got so I guess, uh, you know, good on Chick Gandal for, for being a good hustler, but definitely a bad person. But Joe Jackson, uh, despite getting the $5,000, he did claim that he did his best during the series. Um, you know, there's arguments for him uh, not fixing this series, which is, you know, he hit 375 with a 956 OPS, six RBI to go with that. But there's also an argument for him actually active actively fixing the series he went 0 for 6 with runners in scoring position in the first five games and you know that's where a lot of the white that's where the white Sox did a lot of the fixing you know the first five games they, they uh lost four of those games and they uh only ended up scoring six runs in those five games and you know they were probably one of the best offenses in the league which is why they were there and you know, that leads to uh, his, you know, grand jury testimony, his, the, the case, the, the case where he actually could have gone to jail. Um, he and seven, he and the seven others uh, were not, were found not guilty by a trial jury. But, you know, despite this uh, testimony, uh, they, those eight men were banned for life by Kennesaw Mountain Landis, the new commissioner, Kennesaw Mountain Landis, and Shoeless Joe Jackson cannot play Major League Baseball again. Say what you want about banning the players from the league, but Kennesaw Mountain Landis is an elite name. I don't care what you say. Oh yeah, that's, that's, I, I can, I trust that man, honestly. Oh, absolutely. I think we should bring him back as commissioner. Yeah, that would work. I'd much rather that over the current baseball you know you know what i'm saying chris give me a kennesaw i'm tired i don't want rob yeah get out here even bud i don't not a bud. not a huge fan no so joe shoeless joe jackson gets kicked out of major league baseball and everything from there is kind of post-career uh he played in the southern outlaw leagues and he gave a few newspaper interviews after his career was over uh perhaps talking about the situation perhaps talking about his playing career whatever. He moves back to Greenville, South Carolina, where he ran a successful restaurant and liquor store for many years. And he was introduced into the Indians Hall of Fame in 1951. Also, he would teach baseball to the local youth and organize impromptu baseball games. And unfortunately, he died of heart failure on December 5th, 1951 at the age of 64. So, you know, most people know Shoeless Joe Jackson for the Black Sox, and understandably so. It's still talked about a lot a hundred years later. But this guy, after his retirement, you know, tried to make good for himself, you know, teaching baseball to everyone. Uh, he was a successful businessman, obviously. Um, so he was able to save his image a bit. Not that the public really uh, saw much of it, because there wasn't really much of reporting back then. 
But after the release of Eight Men Out and Field of Dreams in 1988 and 89, respectively, the case for Jackson's reinstatement to the possible Hall of Fame uh, were suddenly reignited. And Field of Dreams, of course, he was, uh, someone playing him had a little cameo in it. And um, there is a clip of Shoeless Joe Jackson playing baseball from that movie. Yeah, yeah, he's gonna hit the curveball. Put one right here, huh? Right? Right. You're a low ball hitter. If there's a, if we end up having a season this year, I really hope we can have that Field of Dreams game between the Yankees and the White Sox that was supposed to be scheduled uh, in August. Yeah, I don't, you know, I don't see why not. Well, the Red Sox Orioles. I mean, I guess this is different, but the Little League Classic was already canceled. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I don't particularly particularly see the reasoning behind that, but I guess I'm not in the business, you know. I mean, the Little League Classic, it's like, you know, the part, the whole point of it is you have all the Little Leaguers coming together and watching the game, and you can't really is, on social distance. You know, the Field yeah, of Dreams that's game, correct. The Field of Dreams game could probably happen, uh, and it would yeah. be more fitting to the movie if they just didn't allow fans. Yeah, Although, I guess. Yeah. I'd feel pretty bad if they literally built a new stadium uh, for no one to come, because if you build it, apparently they won't come because of coronavirus. <laughs> yeah. Tough. Yeah. And uh, his Hall of Fame case was kind of thrown out the window because of Pete Rose and that whole thing came up. And Pete Rose is still heavily talked about with his Hall of Fame case to this day. Yeah, so there was, there was some hope thrown around and then it pretty much it was, it was South Park and it's gone. All that hope yeah. uh, pretty much out the window within a year because of the Pete Rose scandal. But it, this is a show dedicating... dedicating our, this uh, dedicating our you know show to the story of Shoeless Joe Jackson and kind of where he ranks among the baseball greats because I mean if he had a full career in Major League Baseball if you know for if you know Shoeless Joe Jackson was able to find a way out of the the banishment or if he never took the money or whatever he could have been you know talked about on the same level as, you know, an Eddie Collins yeah. or a Rogers Hornsby, you know, uh, guys, guys of that era. He put um, up two nine win seasons. Yes. Yes. So, yeah. So his lifetime 356 batting average, that's right. Had a lifetime 356 batting average that ranks third all time. Also his 170 lifetime OPS plus ranks ninth all time. And his 165 lifetime weighted runs created plus also ranks ninth all time. And Shoeless Joe Jackson, he had five seasons with 35 plus doubles and 15 plus triples. And that is tied for the most amount of such season, seasons by one player in baseball history. He is also one of nine players in baseball history to have three, th three seasons with 190 o with a 190 OPS plus or higher. The other players are Nap Lejoie, Mickey Mantle, Rogers Hornsby, Ty Cobb, Lou Gehrig, Barry Bonds, Ted Williams, and Babe Ruth. Almost all those guys are Hall of Famers. Yeah, almost all those we guys. We gotta get Barry Bonds in there. Yes, yes. And of everyone who has ended up with less than 6,000 plate appearances, he has the most career hits. Also, of every retired player with less than 6,500 plate appearances, he has the highest wins above replacement. And uh, also, you know, he, uh, he has all these accomplishments and he's not in the Hall of Fame, but he did kind of make it to Cooperstown, as you can see from uh, Daniel's, Daniel's background. Shoeless Joe's. Uh, it is a shop opened on the main street of uh, 
Cooperstown, basically right where the Village. Baseball Hall of Fame if is. If you've ever been, if you've ever been to Cooperstown before, you'd know that uh, you basically get out of the middle of the woods and you drive down Main Street and it's just this village of baseball stores everywhere. Like there's the Hall of Fame. If you're coming the way I usually come to your immediate left and then all the way down the right and to the left past the Hall of Fame is just these shops. Like there's a Mickey Mantle shop, uh, like name shop. They sell baseball cards, baseball memorabilia. It's literally just like, Chris, when I eventually take you to Cooperstown, it's literally just a baseball town. Yeah, I'm uh I'm looking forward to that whenever that day may may We were going to we were going to do it over spring break, but uh corona. Yeah, corona. Yeah. It happens. And Shoeless Joe, you know, he had he gets he gets that shop because, you know, he had the most extreme respect from the great game's greatest. You know, he may he may not be a Hall of Famer. You could kind of question his morals, you know, he did end up taking money uh from that series and by his own admissions, he took it on purpose. It wasn't, it wasn't really an accident. He didn't really, you know, he agreed to take money. And whether, you know, whether he played good or not, those are the facts of the situation. But he did get the most extreme respect from the game's greatest. I'll end this Shoeless Joe Jackson segment with a couple of quotes. One from Ty Cobb. Ty Cobb said, quote, he, Shoeless Joe Jackson, was the finest natural hitter in the history of the game. And Babe Ruth also said, I copied Shoeless Joe Jackson's style because I thought he was the greatest hitter I had ever seen. The greatest natural hitter I ever saw. He's the guy who made me a hitter. So there you have it. Crazy respect from Ty Cobb and Babe Ruth, both top four in position player baseball reference for Mm -hmm. so that is the shoeless joe jackson portion of the episode you know Uh, chris we've uh, the last couple weeks we've done a couple you know we with mickey mantle and ted williams part of their legacy was like they obviously are all-time greats but they're what could have been players if mickey mantle stayed healthy if ted williams didn't go off to war and shoeless joe jackson is kind of the ultimate example of that yeah you know and uh this this one was probably the most self-induced, I guess, by you know what could have been or, you know how, how, uh, baseball could have handled this situation or or whatever. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, definitely the the ultimate what could have been. You know, Ted Williams had the wars. Mickey Mantle mm-hmm. had the injuries. And this guy known as all-time greats, regardless. Shoeless Joe, you know he. I mean, he had a Hall of Fame career, like even if he retired just then without playing again, like he did 60, I believe he had 62 uh, baseball reference war. Yes. Yeah, 62.1 in 13 seasons. Like that is plenty enough. Uh, of course, war wasn't considered back then because. Yeah. It was, his, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, his, his, um, his peak war, his uh, war, war seven, best seven seasons that ranks seventh among right fielders all time. So mm-hmm. he, he would have, he had the, one of the greatest peaks ever yeah. by an outfielder. So yep. that closes the book on Shoeless Joe Jackson. A fun one, a fun yeah. story uh, just on off the field stuff. Also great numbers to talk about as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, that closes the book on part one of episode 39 of we'll the show be named later. Friday. We will see you on Friday. We where we will be talking about the 2013 Pittsburgh Pirates, and then we will be also picking our next uh, two topics for yep. next week. So right. we hope to see you then.